Welcome home, neighbors. This is Lauren from California, owner at Copper Creek, and you're listening to My DVC Points. Parents and the children could have fun together. Please board quickly and safely. Our monorail will be departing momentarily. Welcome to the My DVC Points podcast. Join the conversation as DVC members share their stories, personal preferences, and magical memories. Your reservation is confirmed, your fast passes are booked, pull up on the yellow strap because our journey into the magic of membership is about to begin. Now, here's your host and curator of magical stories, Chad Pennycuff. Welcome home, neighbors, to our Villas at Disneyland Hotel review series. And before we jump into today's episode, I want to do a quick shout out of thanks to our sponsors over at DVC Resale Market. If you are looking at buying Villas at Disneyland Hotel, they've already got some resale listings. The first contract has already sold. I believe it was around $160 a point for 150 points. So if you're looking at buying Villas at Disneyland Hotel and you know those are the only place you're ever going to stay on those points, you can save 25, 30 or more percent buying resale. DVCresalemarket.com. Let them know you heard about them here at the My DVC Points podcast. We're going to kick off our review series. And I'm going to welcome a good friend of the show, Dr. Disneyland, Mr. Jeff Barnes, or I guess Dr. Jeff Barnes. You have a real PhD. So that that, that doctor thing is no joke, Jeff. Oh, uh, I actually do. But I think it's way more fun to be Dr. Disneyland than uh, Dr. Barnes. It's kind of like um, Walt never wanted to be called Mr. Disney. I don't like being called Dr. Barnes. I prefer Jeff. And if you got to go there, go with Dr. Disneyland. Okay. Seeing that we're friends, I'm just going to stick with Jeff. And I, I'm, we're going to give the audience that choice as well. But Jeff, let's get back into the Sherman and Peabody Wayback Machine here. And I'm really dating myself with that comment. But let's go way, way, way back to the 1950s. Mm -hmm. Walt's building Disneyland. Mm -hmm. And there comes a a need for like a hotel. But like, wasn't it just like an orange field at the time? And people are like, (laughs) what are you doing out there building this in the middle of nowhere, Walt? Yeah. So Southern California was at one point home to some 40 million orange trees. And uh, a good number of those groves, as you might imagine, were in Orange County. And long before it was Disneyland... It was an orange grove in Anaheim, and he purchased the 160 acres from about 17 different landowners. The citrus industry was in a bit of a downturn in the 1950s, and so it was somewhat affordable. And Anaheim's sort of the middle of nowhere, which is almost impossible to imagine today, right? Anaheim is 30 miles south of Los Angeles. The freeway doesn't go through it, at least not yet. There's 14,000 residents and all of 60 motel rooms. And he's going to build a park that's going to start the Disney park industry. It's going to turn the amusement park industry upside down and completely rethink entertainment and hospitality, not just in the United States, but the world. And he's going to do it in Anaheim, again, home to 14,000 residents and all of 60 motel rooms. Yeah, that's a little bit of a problem if you want to build a world class resort and there are 60 rooms there. (laughs) Anaheim's home to... 14,000 residents, 60 motel rooms, the middle of nowhere, 30 miles south of Los Angeles. And at one point, Walt's getting 800 calls a day asking about overnight accommodations. And he reaches out to the major hotel chains like Marriott, like Hilton, like Sheridan. The challenge there is they, like Walt's wife and Walt's brother, don't believe in the park, convinced that it's going to be bankrupt, shuttered, and forgotten in six months or less. So they want nothing to do with building a hotel next to a brand new enterprise in the middle of nowhere. They turn Walt down. Even though he's getting 800 calls a day, like, and he's out of money at this point in time. I'm assuming like every dime he had was into (laughs) Disneyland. Well, he was always out of money. Like like that story's not new. Uh, He was out of money when he was doing Steamboat Willie. He was out of money when he was doing Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. He was out of money when he boarded the train to come to California (laughs) following the bankruptcy in Kansas City. Walt Disney was always out of money. The original budget for Disneyland was somewhere between three and a half to four million dollars. Walt managed to spend well over 17 million dollars before he opened the gates in July of 1955. And he spent the 17 million dollars without 
owning the shops, owning the restaurants, or even having a hotel, all of that gets leased out because Walt can't afford to own them or operate them. Wow. Okay. So, so that creates a little bit of an opportunity there then for some other people to come in. Cause I, I mean, that's just unfathomable today. Like the Disney corporation keeps a tight control on everything that they possibly can. <laughs> they do. Yeah. And it's really hard to fathom that you would walk down main street and none of that is owned by Disney and Tom Nabby, who was eventually hired by Walt to be Tom Sawyer Island's original Tom Sawyer. He started out selling newspapers on Main Street, but he was doing it for a third-party vendor. He wasn't doing it for Disney. Again, that's an example of how much other companies were represented in the park, not just as sponsors, but as leases. Yeah, he's like giving them a big chunk of the pie. He so is. how did we end up getting the first hotel there? What, do you remember what that was? Or Oh, it's one of my favorite stories. In fact, I was in Orlando on Friday speaking at a Sephora conference, the cosmetic company. And I actually told this story because it, it's a great story and it has so many applications for wherever you are in your own life and in your own business. So Walt had become friends with a fellow by the name of Jack Rather, W-R-A-T-H-E-R. And if you've never heard of Jack Rather, inside or outside of, of, of the Disney circles, you know him because he's in Hollywood at this point producing Lassie and the Lone Ranger television show. So if you've ever seen those shows, you're familiar with Jack Rather's work. He started out as a Texas oil man, has come to California. He's in the entertainment industry. Now he's starting to get into the hospitality business by opening up hotels. And so Walt figures, hey, you know, I can call my friend Jack up. I can share, him, share with him my vision, my dream. He's in Hollywood. I'm in Hollywood. He'll want to make a go of this. And so he brings him out to the construction site in Anaheim, which is still mostly orange groves, walnut trees, bulldozers, and piles of dirt, shares his vision, and then asks if he would build a hotel. And Jack's response is just like Hilton, Marriott, Sheridan, Lily, or Roy. They don't get it. And he too turns Walt down. And then Walt does what he did repeatedly throughout his life and career becomes incredibly persuasive. And the way I've heard the story is he gets down on a knee and with a tear in his eye says to Jack, I've wanted this my entire life. I'm getting 800 calls a day. I'm not going to make it if I don't have a hotel. And then he agreed, and you've already picked up on this, Chad. He agreed to give him the use of the Disney name, which never happened. That's like of, unheard of today. Absolutely. But that's how desperate Walt was for that first hotel. The use of the Disney name and a 99-year lease. And Jack reluctantly agrees. And the hotel opens in October after the park does in July. In fact, if you go back and watch the opening day broadcast, there's a great segment where Ronald Reagan is interviewing one of the celebrities there that day. And they actually pitch the coming of the Disneyland Hotel and its future opening a few months later in October of 1955. Wow. So we didn't open with a hotel. No. But it, it did open, what, from July to November later? No, it opened in October of 1955. Okay, October so it was under construction. Okay, October of 1955. Yep. And at that point in time, was it the building we have now? Was it? No. So that's a, that's a really interesting piece. It was actually more like motels and almost sort of like a 1950s, 60s motor inn type location, which is where the downtown Disney monorail station here is here at Disneyland. And so the, none of the original hotel exists today. They certainly didn't start with the towers. They started with single story, rather pedestrian motel rooms. We don't start getting the towers until the 60s. Wow. Okay. Well, that's pretty quick then to go from the 50s to the 60s and we've got the towers. What yeah. ended up happening to the original buildings then? Did they get converted to something else and they built towers? How did that transition happen? So they kept the original buildings for a while because I don't know that Jack Rather ever made more money than he did on the deal that he had with Walt for the Disneyland Hotel. It was an absolute cash cow. And the towers will come along in the 
early to mid 60s. And there's a great story there that I'll, I'll share with you in just a moment. But I think the biggest advance for the Disneyland Hotel was Walt extending the monorail out. The monorail comes to the park with the Tomorrowland expansion, June 1959. And then two years later, 1961, they'll expand the route by making it a true mode of transportation. Not anything like what you have at Walt Disney World in Florida today, of course, but the closest you would get to an actual mode of transportation, i.e. you could go from the hotel to the park and back. That happens in 1961. Where the station is today is where the monorail ran in 1961, which makes sense because that's where the original rooms and property actually were. Okay. I mean, I'm just sitting here thinking about the cash cowness. Like, you own a hotel and Walt builds the monorail to the hotel and he didn't even own the hotel. Correct. Wow. Okay. But I guess in order to ride the monorail, was it always like it is today? You had to have a park ticket to, to ride the monorail? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's not like in Florida where you could ride the monorail, ride the Skyway, ride the ferry boat and the resort launches and not have a ticket to anything. The monorail is only going to take you to Tomorrowland and or to the Disneyland Hotel. So you're either in the park or you have to have a ticket to get into the park. But... I heard a story, I want to say this was last summer, with a guy, we were in Club 33, and he talked about how growing up, he and his friends would sneak into Disneyland, which I didn't think was possible, but they did it through the monorail station at the Disneyland Hotel. Apparently, if, if you were going to sneak or scam your way in, that was the way to do it. Okay, well, I mean... Hopefully he don't get his 33 membership revoked from that little <laughs> secret right now. But uh, I, I'm not revealing any names, Chad. OK, OK. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, that makes sense to me. If I was going to sneak in there, that that's how I would do it or through a cast back door or something. But yeah. uh, I've heard of people doing that. But OK. Yeah. And so we we don't get the towers until the 1960s. And again, this is a cash cow for Jack and the Rather family. So they're wanting to expand. And of course, the only way to expand is to go up. And Walt's concern, and this is a constant battle with the city of Anaheim, Walt's concern that the towers are going to break the illusion inside the park. Because of course, when he dredged out the rivers of America, he takes that dirt and builds a 12 to 20 foot earthen berm, which keeps the magic of the Magic Kingdom in, the distractions of Southern California out, and you don't ever think about life or the world outside of Disneyland when you're enjoying your day at Walt's original Magic Kingdom. Well, now Jack wants to build a tower and Walt's amenable to it as long as it doesn't break the immersion and the illusion in the park. And so one of the solutions to that is the construction of New Orleans Square, because that is going to give them a brand new land at an elevation that will obstruct the view of the towers from frontier land to the side of the hotel and the towers. Wow. Talk about a brilliant win-win. Yep. And so even today, if you're standing in frontier land, you're not going to be able to see those towers. And part of the reason is because New Orleans Square acts as a screen. Yeah. Cause I've never like noticed it from inside the park. And I guess that's the reason why. Yeah. Which is sort of the opposite of what's going on at Walt Disney World. Very intentionally, the designers, the Imagineers wanted people from Tomorrowland to be able to see the Contemporary Resort and from Adventureland to see the Polynesian Resort because those fit thematically, even though they're outside the park. Yeah, that makes sense to me as well. And even Bay Lake Tower now, you can get a great view of it from inside the park at Tomorrowland. Yeah. Which, yep. again, it's the Contemporary Resort. It fits with Tomorrowland, whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. And I, I've also heard that the whole Mary Poppins Victorian era of the Grand Floridian was meant to match Main Street as well. Hmm. I so, have never heard that, but that makes sense. Yeah, that's, that's like one of the, uh, I guess, fan theories that I've heard. Hmm. It, it does make sense when you start to look at it. and. Yep. You know, and then I guess if you take it one step further, maybe Fort Wilderness Campground kind of met, matches Frontierland. 
So although yeah, there's no that, line of sight there, but I was gonna say there's no real line of sight. Yeah, but yeah, okay. So back over to Disneyland then. Mm -hmm. So which we've got the one tower, but now we've got three. So how did we get from one to three? Again, it's just expansion over the years based on the popularity of the hotel and the demand. For years, this is uh, the only hotel on a property at the Disneyland, now Disneyland Resort. And Disney's not in the hotel business at all and really didn't plan on getting into the hotel business when they were building Walt Disney World. Those were under construction and the plan was for them to be operated by U.S. Steel. Yeah, they they originally were not in the hotel business. And Correct, it, which is really fascinating because you can make the argument that in Central Florida, Disney's way more in the hotel business than they even are the theme park business. Especially the timeshare business with, oh my gosh, you know, yeah. 10 or 12 resorts right there in Orlando. It, it's exactly. plus Vero, plus Hilton Head, plus, yeah, they're, they're definitely hotel business now in, in, my goodness, I can't imagine a travel agent creating a, a hotel package or a package for people that didn't include hotel, theme parks, maybe mm -hmm. even meal plans, all of that. Yeah. And, and park tickets is one bundled package. Although yeah. there's certainly yeah. a, a lot of offsite hotels and a lot of people coming in and, and not staying on property. Correct. And you have to think about Disney liked for years and years and years, the way the Disneyland Hotel was being run, even if they had given away the name and the 99-year lease. And ultimately, that would become problematic, and we can talk about that in a bit. But compared to the third-rate Las Vegas that was going on down Harbor Boulevard or across from Catella, you know, they would much prefer their guests be at the Disneyland Hotel and continue expanding that than to see more and more and more of, again, third-rate Las Vegas just explode and mushroom around them. Yeah, I guess that's a great way to call it, third-rate Las Vegas. I think it's cleaned up quite a bit now because I think Harbor Boulevard, Catella is all pretty nice, but I we can think the city of Anaheim and the convention center and all of the the work that's gone into that and the the property values are probably just insane right there. They are, but you can also think Disney, because they were able to get control of the Disneyland Hotel back. And you can also think Disney's California Adventure. The main goal of Disney's California Adventure wasn't to give Disney a second gate in Anaheim, although that was like certainly part of it. The main goal was to create enough hotel occupancy in the city of Anaheim so that the city would have the money to create the Disneyland Resort District and clean up the area two miles around the park. And so if you look at the way it was around Disneyland in the late 80s, early 90s versus 2001 and beyond, it is a night and day difference. And yes, the city worked hard to accomplish that. And some of the funding came from the opening of DCA, the increased hotel occupancy, and the city ended up, you know, spending the money on getting that cleaned up and sort of a war between Anaheim and Long Beach over who was going to get that second gate. Yeah, because it was supposed to be like Westcott way over there or something like that, right? Yeah, it was supposed to it was supposed to be Westcott and then Disneyland Paris tanks financially. And so the city starts not the city, but Disney starts rethinking everything. And they managed to get the hotel from the Rather family. I want to say that Jack died in 1984 and they were finally able to come to terms with the family in 1988. But part of those terms, and I think this is fascinating, part of those terms included, you know, my dad had some other assets that are a little weird and on the books and we're not exactly sure what to do with them. If we sell you the hotel back, you got to take these assets too. Well, those assets were the Queen Mary and the Spruce Goose in Long Beach. Okay. And so for a period of time, because Disney owned those assets, they developed an entire park in Long Beach. And what that helped accomplish was convincing the city of Anaheim to play ball on giving Disney a second gate and getting the area cleaned up around the resort. Otherwise, they were just going to invest in Long Beach. 
that's a heck of a motivation, right? You're either going to clean this up and let us do what we want, or yep. we'll take our toys and play elsewhere. Yep. And elsewhere is 20 minutes down the road. Correct. And if you've ever been to Tokyo Disney Seas in Japan, that was originally planned for Long Beach. That was going to be Disney's second gate in Southern California. Got it. And again, the hotel, the hotel plays a part in all of this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, Jeff. So at this point in time, we've gotten DCA in there. And mm -hmm. I know we're skipping a bunch of history here, but I, I kind of want to limit the show to eh, 30, 40 minutes ish. And I want to talk about the West end of downtown Disney today was demolished so that we could get a DVC building. And that <laughs> never happened. Like, like what's the story there? So again, let's go back in the, in the, in the time machine. When Walt first dreamed of a place where parents and children could have fun together, he had eight acres next to the studio in Burbank. He draws up plans for what he was going to call Mickey Mouse Park, takes it to the Burbank City Council in 1952. And they're like, yeah, we don't get it. And we don't want a carnival atmosphere in our town. And so they told Walt no. Well, Walt knew that no simply meant next option. And so he hires the Stanford Research Group to find the best location in Southern California to build Disneyland, which is now ballooned to what, 160 acres. And um, they would look at 150 different sites, propose four of those sites to Walt, number one being the Ball Road sub subdivision in Anaheim, California. Well, fortunately, Disney had a relationship with the city of Anaheim and Anaheim wanted Disneyland, unlike Burbank. So sort of the real unsung hero in all of this is the city manager by the name of Murdoch, who welcomed Disney with open arms. And again, Disney had a positive relationship. They had been providing materials for their annual Halloween parade in Anaheim for a few years. And now they want to come down and do Disneyland. And the city is like, oh, man, that would be absolutely amazing. And Ken Murdoch sort of moves mountains to make it happen possible for Walt to build Disneyland where he wanted to build it on the Ball Road subdivision versus the city council north in Burbank saying, ah, we don't think so. We don't want a carnival atmosphere in our town. Well, the relationship between Disney and Anaheim starts out positive. Historically, by and large, over the years has been positive. But every now and again, the relationship can turn south. The relationship can turn sour. Relationships are difficult, right? <laughs> so Yeah, yeah, you know, and there's a lot of work. Yeah, yeah Disney's got to have a relationship with the city, and every now and again, that relationship isn't great. So, for example, in the 60s, Anaheim was giving people, companies, groups permission uh, to build up in Anaheim, and Walt had to go and make a pitch and say, look, we put the city on the map. You're going to kill the goose that laid the golden egg if my guests are inside Disneyland and they can see the outside world beyond the berm. And so they agreed reluctantly to create ordinances that prevented high rises immediately around Disneyland. And then as you get farther and farther out, the permissible height of a building rose as you got farther and farther away. Well, fast forward, you know, people have assumed that Anaheim bends over backwards to make Disney happy, to keep Disney happy. Disney doesn't pay its fair share. Uh, you hear some of that last year in the whole Reedy Creek argument in the state of Florida. That's a completely different deal, but people just assume, oh, well, they're not paying their taxes. You know, we're getting ripped off, blah, 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 blah. And so right before the pandemic, there was a lot of politics in Anaheim about getting tougher on Disney and not letting Disney do whatever they wanted and all of that sort of thing. And so the original plan for the fourth hotel, which was going to take up a large amount of space at the West end of downtown Disney included about $480 million in tax break. And at the last minute, Disney redid the design for the hotel and the city, because now they've got a new city council and they want to look like they're tough on Disney. And they're like, you can do that, but this new design doesn't qualify you for the $480 million in tax cuts that we had granted you. And ultimately, Disney bails on the deal because for them, economically, it only made sense if they were saving $480 million in, in taxes. Okay, so the elected officials, it sounds like. New set of politicians come in. 
they're not so favorable. They campaign on it. We're going to get tough on Disney. Yep. And so they kind of get tough on Disney and Disney walks away from the deal and says, hey, we're out. Correct. And, and what's really interesting about that is they had not yet started demolishing the buildings on the West End. They had closed. They had shut down. But the theater was still there. Earl of Sandwich was still there. ESPN Zone was still there. Rainforest Cafe. Like, they're all still there. They're just empty, waiting to be demolished to make room for this fourth hotel that Disney ultimately decides not to build. It was really awkward. Yeah. I mean, we closed the Earl for crying out loud. That I know. That, that's like that's like Disneyland legend. You know what I'm saying? It's 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 the Earl is like right up there in my opinion. It, yeah. It's I, I can't go to Disneyland without at least two stops at the Earl. Like it's yeah. well, and the only one of those that reopened was the Earl. And then when it ultimately got demolished, it got moved because it was easily the most popular of any of those locations on the West End. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's 50 million theaters around. Like if you're a local, why would you go through all the hassle of parking and going through security to get into AMC theaters at downtown Disney? And right. It, it That just doesn't make sense to me. It's just too crowded. Yep. Disney Springs makes a little bit more sense because the theater is right there by the parking deck. Boom, you park, you, you get in. It's not much more than going to any other theater. Well, and the parking at Disney Springs is free. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's that's very true. Not so much there at downtown Disney. So, yeah. well, and the craziest thing to me was Disney had spent a year building a new Starbucks on the West End. And, and, and I joke about this all the time. Disneyland was built in a year and it took them longer to build this new Starbucks on the West End of downtown Disney, right? I don't think it lasted a year before all of a sudden it's gone because it's going to get demolished in this new hotel that they've decided that they want to build, which ultimately does not get built. Yeah. So do you know what the plans are for that space now? I mean, right now we've got like a new entrance coming in that's right here by our villas. So we were just there last night. We actually went into the DVC Tower, by the way. It's absolutely stunning. There's a major refresh going on with downtown Disney, and I see it going in a very positive direction. New restaurants, new shops, things like Tortilla Joe's. Like I think Tortilla Joe's has been there since downtown Disney opened in 2001. I love Mexican, but Tortilla Joe's isn't it. It's finally going away. And so there's a major refresh with very popular restaurants. Yeah, I know there's a bakery and a dim sum. And yep. Yeah, the dim like, sum is going to be amazing. The Portos, I think that's the name of it, which you can get near Knott's Berry Farm, but now you're going to be able to get it at downtown Disney. So the space where the hotel was going to go, and if you look, you can look this up online, Fourth Disneyland Hotel. It was a really awkward design. Because there's like this parking lot north of downtown Disney that, and so it was going to start there, like between, say, the Disneyland Hotel and the Pixar and Friends slash Mickey and Friends parking garage. Like it was going to start there, but then it was going to eat up part of the west end of downtown Disney. Well, yeah, I looked at it and it was like three stories. And I'm like, why are you guys not building a tower here? This is makes no sense to me. Yeah. And so, again, I don't necessarily agree with the politics that caused the demise of this project. But having said that, I think we're better for it if for no other reason it, it wasn't a great project regardless. And it is going to leave us room for what is now being called the Disneyland Forward, which is going to give us all sorts of new ride shows, attractions, lands, you name it. I think that's a much, 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 much better use of space. And I would rather the Disneyland Villas Tower be where it's at. And I understand why it's there. I don't like the location particularly that much today, but I, I keep having to remind myself, I knew this when I bought it, that it's all about the future and the Disneyland expansion projects. And that's going to make this amazing in being that close to downtown Disney and still part of the bubble and, yep. and all of that. Yeah. Have you been into the, have you been to the new Villas yet? Yeah, I've been there twice, and okay. I'm, I'm I'm headed there Saturday as well, so oh, I'll, I'll right. be back. Yeah, no, it, they're absolutely amazing. Okay, so do you know anything about how we ended up with the tower here, and 
why like the design doesn't match the other three towers it's it's just like it's it's a sore thumb to me like i'm like what's up with that i don't know and i have wondered that myself out of any disney property that i've ever stayed at and i was at animal kingdom lodge last weekend contemporary resort last month you name it disney cruises boardwalk the disneyland hotel is far and away my favorite disney property because it's just classic wall classic mid-century modern it just has an amazing vibe. And I love the DVC Villa Tower. I think it's phenomenal, except it doesn't match. And I, and I don't know. I, and when I say it, it doesn't match, it's not just the size and the scale and the scope. It's the color. And the, the colors are great, but they don't match the other three towers. Like, it's yeah, not it sticks color. out like a sore thumb. And... The pool deck is in a weird location going under the tower. They expanded that and I'm like scratching my head here and you check in, you got to drag your bags all the way around the pool area to come into the far side of it. You can't cut through the pool deck area to get in. If it's after X amount of time and the pool decks closed, your key won't work. It's just, it's just really kind of awkward to me. And hmm. I get the feeling they shoehorned that in there as best that they could. Well, no, they absolutely shoehorned it. There's no doubt about it. And they shoehorned it into a space that, A, already has three towers and is sharing common facilities like the pool in the center, like Trader Sam's. And they wanted, it was obvious to me when I was there last night, they wanted folks at the villas to sort of have their own bubble within the bubble but it's a very small space with everyone else in the other three towers having access to, you know, everything that's just a few feet away from the villas. Yeah, it, it definitely, that is the vibe. I mean, it, I, I think that's the first time I've heard it expressed. It's kind of a bubble within a bubble. Mm -hmm. And that kind of makes sense to me because the theming is all different. And I love our little quiet pool and splash pool and the Mickey area. And, Got to hang out there with Caleb and some of our team the other on my last visit. It was amazing and I loved it. And I started to get the garden studios because I like that vibe out there by the pool so much. Mm -hmm. So it's like I, I really started to get the wisdom of all of that and why those things are so high demand and people love them because it's right there in the bubble within the bubble, I guess is yeah. the best way to, to describe it. I think what's coming to mind for me, and I think this will make sense, if you've ever done a Disney cruise, you have the pool out in the center area, deck 11, right? And anyone and everyone can have access. And then you have the adult areas, right? Mm -hmm. The DVC pool is sort of the adult area <laughs> on a Disney cruise. It's really, really close to the pool that everyone else has access to, except they don't. Yeah. I mean, they, they technically do. They can walk over there if they want to, but it's you've got the bar there that kind of like separates it out and, and everything else. Yeah, I was a little surprised that access was so readily available. Like, you don't have to be a DVC member to go into those common spaces for the villas. No, you don't. It's it's all the same resort. It's it's the Disneyland Hotel Resort. Yeah. And yeah. so, Jeff, do you have any insight or history on like this transient tax deal? Because I know that's a big sticking point for a lot of people who are looking at this hotel and why it's so high and. Any insights as to why this is so much more than Grand Cal? No, not specifically. Again, the politics in California just gets more and more and more expensive. People are just trying to find ways to make sure things get paid for. And anytime, anytime there's new development in California, it's going to be taxed at an insane rate to try and pay back infrastructure that's just grossly behind. Got it. So the city really had to put in more sewer, more water, more electricity, beef up all of that yep. in order to support this expansion that's coming there. And somebody has to pay for it. Correct. And, and they also have to be really careful that the residents of Anaheim don't have the perception that it's on their backs. Yeah, that would be really, really important because when you're in that tower, you're literally looking down into their backyards. Correct. Like, and, like it, it's And a sticking point here. In order to do the Disneyland Resort, the Grand Californian, DCA, you had to do the Mickey and Friends parking structure, right? Because DCA sits where the Disneyland parking lot used to be. You wipe out that parking lot. Well, where's everyone going to park? Well, 
you create what was then the world's largest parking garage, Mickey and Friends, they managed to talk the city of Anaheim into paying for that garage. Disney keeps all of the revenue, but it was paid for by the citizens of Anaheim. So if you're a property owner in Anaheim, to this day, when you get your property tax bill, there's a line item, Disney's parking garage. Wow. That would be a hard pill to swallow. And here we are, what, 20 plus years later? And people are like, yeah, we're not doing that again. Yeah. Okay. That gives me a little bit more insight into that as to why that is and how that came about. And from what I'm told with DVC insiders, they really, truly believe that this was their last shot at doing a DVC building in Disneyland. Oh, I think that's probably true. That this is it. There's like no other land that they can buy, no other expansion areas, no nothing. And so this was the last hurrah. And so in order to get it, they had to cut a deal with the double with these insanely high transient taxes. Correct. And just so you know, like I was there for three nights and my transient tax was over 200 bucks in just a studio. Yeah. And, and I could have got the Marriott across the street for one night for that price. Correct. Like, like it's, it's that, that level of insane. So the transient tax is about a third of what a hotel is. On yep. top of my dues, on top yep. of what I paid for the points. Yep. And the elected officials in Anaheim are able to say to their constituents, we're finally making Disney and Disney's guests pay their fair share. It's not yeah. on your backs anymore. Yeah. Well, given the history of the Mickey and Friends deal that you shared with us today, I now get that. And I, do I like it that I have to pay it? No. But if I was a resident there and I'm paying taxes 20 years later for a parking structure that Disney keeps all the money on. I'd be a little ticked as well. So <laughs> that right there is a huge insight into the people versus the town and gown that you see arguments that go on with colleges. You still got that same dynamic going on mm -hmm. there in Anaheim. Yep. As, or, as or, well. Or, or even sports teams, right? Yeah. So it's yeah. like, how do we keep the team, but not give away the store in doing so? which is always the big development push that happens, right? Every sports team under the sun tries to get the taxpayers to build their stadium. Of course they and do. Then, and then leaves it within, as soon as they can contractually. Yep. Yeah, to so go to Disney the next bigger and better get, one. Disney was able to get the city to build them a garage, but now the city is like, not happening. Yeah. Okay. Well, I understand that as well. So, Jeff, I want to thank you for being on our show today. And I, I want to take a couple of moments here to talk about two specific things, right? One, I, I know you do some professional speaking. So how can somebody come back in and book you as a professional speaker or if they work for a company, throw your name in the hat? Because I know you mentioned you did Sephora mm -hmm. at the beginning of the show. What is that process like and how can somebody come back in and do it? Because you have an amazing, amazing, amazing authors, books courses on the wisdom of Walt. And it's all about taking Walt's mentality and applying it to our everyday life. Yeah. So an example of how that works, Walt had to beg for the first hotel, right? Get down on his knee, tear in his eye, plead with Jack Rather, give away his name, a 99-year lease. Today at Walt Disney World, if you wanted to spend a different night in a different hotel room at a Disney resort, would take you more than 75 years before you ran out of room. So... Think about where you are versus where you want to be and how big you could actually go if you believed in who you are and what you're actually doing. Walt believed in his dream and he was able to convince Jack Rather. And now they own so many hotels. It would take you 75 years to run out of rooms if you wanted to stay in a different one. So, again, I, I speak all over the country, all sorts of companies, Sephora, Pampered Chef, Caterpillar. And anyone who's interested can find me at thewisdomofwalt.com. Okay, awesome. Now, that, that's like the corporate speaking side. But last time we talked, you were in the process of developing some individual courses or, or beyond yeah, your cool. books. Because you can, I, your books are amazing. I, I made my daughter read them as part <laughs> of her, like, earning a, a, a trip here to Walt Disney World to go nice. to a, a personal development concert. Yeah. So uh, I think, first of all, I, I have a Wednesdays with Walt email that's motivational, inspirational. It's 100% free. So anybody can go to my website and under resources, sign up for the free blog. Again, every Wednesday, 100% free. 
And then I do have my History of Disneyland course available online, and we're in the process of developing a course based on the Wisdom of Walt series. Awesome. Because I knew the History of Disneyland was coming back in. And just so everybody knows, you got the title of Dr. Disneyland because you developed the first college level accredited course in the history of Disney here. It's, so, so It's crazy, right? But again, it wasn't about the park. It was about obstacles and adversities and dreams and success. And what does it take to, to be resilient and make things happen? Not so that you can change the world the way that Walt did, but you could at least change your world. And there's a lot of lessons in Walt's life, in these stories and history of Disneyland and the way the company has kept going at Walt Disney World and literally around the world. Yeah, a lot of great personal growth and, and opportunities. And if you're a fan of Disney, like everybody listening to this show is, I can't speak highly enough of your books, your courses, your materials, because you literally do take the wisdom of Walt and package it up so that we can start to come back in and think about those things and, and figure out, hey, how can I take things to the next level? How can I overcome the way Walt did? Yep. And personal growth and development 101. And I can't say enough great things about you, your courses and everything that you've done as well for me and my family. Because again, I made my 12 year old daughter do that. <laughs> and, you know, she's she's doing all well. She's doing OK. Like yeah. I'm, I'm about thank you one day. Yeah. Yeah. She's awesome. Know, checking out her dreams. We have to go back to uh, Culinary Institute of America at Hyde Park in New York. She's considering a career there. And Very if you're cool. going to go into the food deal, that's the Harvard of culinary. So awesome. Yeah. I can't thank you enough for uh, all that you've helped her along the way and those uh, goal setting and, and dream setting things that you inspired in her life, Jeff. So very cool. Okay. Well, that puts another episode in the books. I'd like to thank Jeff for joining us and thank you for listening in. Also a huge shout out of thanks to our sponsors over at World of DVC, including DVC Rental Store, DVC Resale Market, and Monera Financial. Also a huge shout out of thanks to our Patreons. If our content has been a blessing in your life, consider joining us on Patreon and helping offset some of the expenses of the show. I know I just ordered a brand new teleprompter that's going to help me create some more made for YouTube content that's coming up and start to get our message of Disney and Disney Vacation Club is a great thing for the right people. And how do we help people start to figure that out? And how do we get them into our community and help them through this decision making process of buying or selling DVC and if it's right for their family? Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We've got resort reviews coming up, restaurant reviews, and then all of the resort amenities and activities, and we'll get into a little bit of the entertainment options in downtown Disney at that particular point in time. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Have a great day. Ladies and gentlemen, please watch your head and step as you exit and take small children by the hand. Aw, oh, chill up, Dad. You know we'll come back. What DVC? My DVC Points is an unofficial Disney-inspired podcast created by fans of Disney Vacation Club. The thoughts expressed in this podcast are personal opinions and personal experiences. My DVC Points is not affiliated with Disney Vacation Club, the Walt Disney Companies, or any subsidiaries. We encourage listeners to contact their DVC guide or member services for official DVC policies.